When was the last time you really thought about saves? Like, really thought about them? Save systems aren't as flashy as skill trees, as notorious as microtransactions, or as widespread as experience points. But a game's save system is just as important. Saves are part of the bedrock of a game's design. They touch on risk tolerance, experimentation, safety, social factors, quit rates, metagaming, and more. And there are dozens of different flavors that each shape how a game feels differently. The right save system in the right game can create an entirely new subgenre. But a wrong combo can collapse the house of cards just as much as janky combat. Let's talk about different styles of save systems, trade-offs for each, and how you determine what's worth saving. Save your ears with today's episode sponsor, Raycon. I've been using Raycon's everyday earbuds for a few years now, and I love them. I listen to podcasts while I take walks, and these are really comfortable for long-time use while you're outdoors. Raycon's engineers have designed the everyday earbuds and the included custom gel tips to fit great in every ear type, big and small, for a comfortable, no-budge fit. They look great, sound great, they have over 49,000 five-star reviews, and are priced at half the cost of other high-end earbud options, with all the high-end features. Siri and Alexa support, wireless charging, noise isolation mode, water resistance, customizable audio profiles that sound great no matter what you're listening to. And they'll run for 8 hours of playtime, plus 32 hours of battery life stored in the capsule charger. Click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com slash designdoc to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. I love my Raycons, and I think you will too. Thanks, Raycon. So, what's the point of saving? Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Saving your game lets you continue it later. It carries over data from session to session, so you can leave it and pick up where you left off. But that also implies some things that are a little more subtle. A world without saving has a pretty severe impact on what a game can even be. Without saves, a game's length can only last as long as the average person keeps it powered on. Anything you want the game to be would have to fit in that short amount of time. Story-heavy games would be incredibly limited. It's hard to tell a lengthy saga if you'd have to keep your NES running for 40 hours to tell it. Long-term progression of all kinds, mechanical, character stats, rewards, and unlocks, they're all very tough to incorporate into a game if you can't carry over your progress to the next session. Of course, that doesn't mean that there weren't games without saves. They were just designed differently. Arcade games were designed with short play sessions to get you to pump in quarters and usually didn't have a way to save your progress. The first home consoles carried over that arcade game design philosophy and were made to be both short in length and brutal to complete to stretch out their playtime. Games were designed to start you over from the beginning. Checkpoints were temporary and lives were limited. Once you got a game over or just had to end the play session, your progress was gone. If you wanted to finish a single player game like Ninja Gaiden, Contra, or Rygar, you had to be patient. Start from the beginning, slowly become an expert at the game's systems, and work your way up to having that perfect run. For those who get to the end, it can be incredibly satisfying. The road to get there will infuriate people though, and has a good chance of alienating anyone who doesn't or can't get to the end. It can be fun, but it won't be for everyone. Some games without saves were designed a little differently. Sonic 2 can be cleared in about an hour, and the stages are short, sweet, and filled with multiple paths to keep things fresh during repeat playthroughs. Super Mario Bros. had warp pipes that let you skip to the later stages relatively quickly, if you knew where to find them. But if you try to just power through a game's design without adapting it for a saveless environment, you might run into problems. Micro Machines for the NES tried to. It's a super fun 8-bit racing game. I had the Game Boy Color port, Micro Machines 1 and 2 Twin Turbo, and it was one of my go-to road trip games. There were loads of inventive tracks, each creatively themed, and using totally unique vehicles to race on each one of them. Go head-to-head -head versus several AIs of different skill levels in a progressive structure with a couple dozen different matchups. Can you get to the end? No, probably not. The game has absolutely no way to save your progress. No card save, no level skip, nothing. The game even saves your fastest lap times, at least until you powered it off. Every time you boot it up, you're starting at the bottom of the ladder and seeing how far you get before your batteries run out. The game uses concepts that really only work if your progression can be resumed and your records kept, but provides no functionality to do so. But this isn't a video about not saving, so if we're gonna try to save data, what's the quickest, fastest, cheapest, and easiest way to do it? You won't need a battery in a cart or a hard drive or cloud storage. 
Just pen and paper. Passwords. Passwords were very popular ways to save your progress around the 8-bit era, without having to include persistent memory inside a cartridge. A game safe password can do one of two things. It can either be a secret code to unlock a set of features, or you can use a password to code in specific data, then decode it later to interpret back out what all that data means. That type lets you store a whole lot more information, like saving exactly how much money you have, which bad guys you've taken care of in which levels, what exact coins you picked up, and so on. If you see a password like this, you're probably dealing with that basic level select type of password. If you see this, that usually means there is a bunch more fine-grained data being stored inside that password. Passwords are surprisingly convenient for some things. They're way more shareable than a cartridge save. A magazine could just print this out and get a final boss warp out to thousands of people. Hell, the thousands of you watching right now can take this and start up my terrible Kid Icarus save. But passwords can be pretty annoying too. You have to manually write it down. And if your handwriting is bad, you're out of luck. If you flip letters and numbers around, you're also out of luck. Wouldn't it be easier if you just said when you wanted to save and the machine kept track of it all for you? Passwords fell out of favor and gave way to hardware saves as the cost of RAM chips became cheaper. It was a lot more convenient, and hardware saves let some new behaviors appear. There are many different ways to flavor a hardware save system, but they fall under a couple of broad categories, freeform and designated save points. Freeform save points let you save just about anywhere you want. Take a step, save. Take another, save. Use an item, save. Maybe you can't save all the time like during combat or against a boss, but everything's kept on disk for you to pick back up when you load next. Players get the maximum sense of security that they won't lose any progress they've made, but there are downsides too. Freeform saving greatly reduces the tension of losing progress from dying to something. There are plenty of games where that's okay. Story-driven games, for example, don't usually get their fun from the risk of losing your progress and having to replay parts of it. But plenty of other games, often more action-focused, use that tension as part of the internal drama of the game. Freeform saving removes that drama almost completely, which might play into what the game wants to highlight, but might not. On the flip side, freeform saving encourages more risk-taking and experimentation. If the downside for failing is low, why not take more chances? It's a trade-off. It also can be an invitation for players to undermine some of a game's intentions. Limitless saving can invite a thing called save scumming. Save scumming is a strategy where a player frequently reloads a save to manipulate what will happen next. If you're about to go into a fight centered around random chance, and the devs aren't careful, save scumming takes the randomness out of an encounter, at the cost of a bunch of repetitive reloading. Take XCOM. XCOM is built around attacks that have a percent chance to hit. The game has some built-in anti-save scumming features to keep track of the dice rolls from load to load. If they hadn't done that, save scumming would let you keep reloading that same fight until that rare 5% chance to hit actually succeeded. If you're just gonna reload a game until it goes your way, that's not really a random roll of the dice now, is it? A player might reload a fight repeatedly to get a rare loot drop or gain an enemy attack pattern that's easier to beat. It's a strange side effect of the convenience and security of unlimited saves that creates a tedious optimal strategy for some encounters. This can also apply to emulated games with save states and rewind features. Developers can work around it by saving a big list of random dice rolls early on and just reading from the table instead of re-rolling it live on each reload. Still, it's something they do have to keep in mind, so they don't accidentally create an experience they didn't want. Or you could go in the total opposite direction and embrace save scumming. Fire Emblem is a series that uses random rolls for attacks a lot like XCOM, and permadeath for its characters, which creates a pretty significant incentive to start over the second something goes wrong. Fire Emblem Three Houses is the newest game in the series and has a feature called Divine Pulse, which canonizes the save scumming process by letting you rewind a battle a limited number of times to course correct if you made a fatal mistake, instead of reloading the whole fight from the start. The feature takes some of the tedium out of the process of reloading, which makes it a nice quality of life benefit if the devs are going to tolerate save scumming as part of the game. You can't just do the same actions and expect different results though. The random rolls are saved in a way where repeating the exact same actions will wind up with the same outcome. It's there to let you adjust to a new winning strategy. Other games only let you save at designated places during play. In games like Kingdom Hearts, you can only save at one of these things and nowhere else. Often, these save points pull double duty as safe havens to heal, restock, strategize, and prepare. 
the placement of save points isn't usually random, especially in games that use them as places to refresh your characters. They tend to be spaced out evenly, or before major events. In many games, save points are implicit signals that a boss fight is about to start. Some games gave you a portable designated save point and let you set it wherever you wanted. Final Fantasy VII gave you one in the final dungeon, but only one. Place it too early and you might have a long gauntlet to get to the end, wherever that was. It would be a clever way to get around the major event telegraphing problem that hard save points created, though in this game specifically, it was still pretty obvious where the final boss was. If you want something a little less permanent, the idea works with checkpoints too. Demon Turf is a 3D platformer a la Mario 64, where you're stringing together your different movement options to bounce and dive all over the place. You'd be surprised where you can get to, but learning requires a good amount of experimentation and risk taking. The game gives you three checkpoint flags that you can plant anywhere you want to encourage you to take chances with where you jump to next. You can't be completely careless with them, but you get to choose exactly where you feel like you really need them so you don't have to repeat an easy chunk of the level. You can even teleport between the flags, which can be handy for finding collectibles. If there are only going to be save points in certain places of the game, the placement of those save points matters more than you might think. The longer the game goes between save points, the greater the stakes. Whether you can reuse a save point matters too. Unlimited save points, especially ones where you can heal and restock, can act as a base of operations, letting players brute force grind for experience in an area without risking much, using the save point as an anchor. The classic Resident Evil games try to avoid this problem by making saves a consumable item. There are safe rooms scattered throughout where you can take a breather, manage resources with the storage box, and save your game but only if you have an ink ribbon. Saves themselves are a limited resource, just like healing herbs and ammo. You can't just pop in and out of the safe room and save whenever you want. You need to pace yourself and press your luck a little, either now when you know what you're facing, or later if you run out of ink ribbons and have to keep going until you find another one. Resident Evil 4 dropped the save system as a quality of life feature, but the recent Resident Evil 2 remake brought it back as part of the hardcore difficulty option, and would even take into account how many saves you use to rank you at the end of the game. Man, all these hardware save types seem like a pain to sort through. What if we could just get the computer to do it for you? Like, automatically. Auto... saves. Oh, right, yeah, that exists. Auto saving takes all the work out of saving, with one horrible cost. If you're relying on an algorithm to save for you, you need to make sure it can't softlock the game. Softlocking involves creating any situation where the game cannot let you continue. It might be that the game locks you out of a room or away from an item you need to progress. It can also be autosaving you into an unwinnable position, where reloading a save puts you back into a place where the enemies are too high leveled and you can't catch up, or without enough ammo to take on the next horde without a way to get more, or in the middle of getting ambushed in a way that you can't get away from. Softlocking in an autosave only game can be devastating in the worst case making the entire save file completely useless. Layering autosaving on top of other saving techniques and having recent backup save files is practically a necessity to keep from causing horrific softlock scenarios. Cool, so those are the basic save styles, but we can go deeper. Some of the most creative uses of saves have been when they get treated not just as a utility, but as another game element. What if saving is just another part of gameplay? Donkey Kong Country 2 would let you save, but if you wanted to save in the same world a second time, it cost you two banana coins. The Japanese version of the game only costs one coin for some reason. It's not hard to collect two coins, but it does create a fiddly little extra step before saving. It's, I guess, an attempt to make collectibles feel more meaningful and less like an anonymous checklist to complete for no rewards, but this is still a half-baked idea. Luckily, it's pretty ignorable. The GBA port of the game cut this out and let you save wherever. Steel Battalion used the save file as a long-term pause rather than a checkpoint. Even with a saved game, you were under the constant threat of losing it. If you died or ran out of money in-game, your save would blow up alongside your mech. The setup definitely made you value your life in-game more and made you more cautious, but it did increase stress. It's an interesting approach for a game that wants to crank up the stakes, and games with Iron Man modes used the same idea and most roguelikes are also built around the save game as more of a pause than a life preserver. Shovel Knight found a way to use the convenience of frequent checkpoints, but with a fun challenge baked in. 
Shovel Knight uses these glass orbs as checkpoints, but you don't have to use them. If you don't want to save, you can break most of them for extra cash. If you're feeling confident, you can spice up the game's difficulty to your tolerance level and progress even faster if you make it through. But if you're shaky, the same system lets you have the convenience of modern save-happy design. The game becomes adaptable to different players and playstyles, helping make the experience more fun for a wider group of people. Save your spot down in the comments, where we'll talk about some save horror stories, and any game you can think of that treats saves in a unique way. Save systems are part of the bedrock of game design, and thinking through the decisions you make here can save a game. That, that was terrible. Quick load. Saves are important. Do them good. Flawless.